Um, we're going to first of all do a recap because I can see some faces here that um, haven't um, been here before. Uh, you are welcome to be here, but uh, we'll just give you a little bit of a recap and it's a good way for us to um, get our heads around the um, message today because it is a big message um, that has been built layer upon layer. Starting with uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 where God tells us about three elements that are in chaos, they're in destruction and uh, they believe, I believe that that's because the enemy, the devil and the third of the angels in heaven as scripture tells us was kicked out to the earth and where he comes, we know he likes to rob, kill and destroy. And so he brings destruction. And uh, the words used in Hebrew for verse 2 very much indicate that uh, indistinguishable ruin is one of the words used. And so hence, um, we have the earth. It was completely uh, null and void. Uh, darkness was there, which is the absence of light and energy and etc. And uh, deep waters the surging abyss of waters that go to the abyss was also um, on the earth. So nothing, there was no life. It was destruction except for the Holy Spirit that was hovering there. Um, he was the only hope of life that was there. Then we went to uh, our next message, covered um, the days of creation, the six days of creation and how it dealt with each of those three areas. So you see on day one, um, light is contained. It contains the darkness. It's given a parameter to live in. And then day four, the lamps are created to rule um, in the night as well as the, the day. Um, day two, the waters are separated by the heavens. Day five, the waters below are given fish and um, bird life to live in and dwell in those areas. Day three, the dry form, forming of the land appears and plants just spring forth. It's no longer void. Uh, and then day six, the vegetation uh, and sculptured land are now given animal life and human life to rule it. And so you can see there's a pattern that's taking place of threes continuously dealing with these three chaotic elements and now bringing them back into um, order and then to life into those uh, three elements. And so we again went into another message or another facet of the message relating it to man we first of all went to the aspect that man is made up of those three elements water earth as well as gases so naturally we have that um, then we have this the, the I, I call it more the spiritual parts of us as such but we have the the aspect of being spirit soul and body and interesting the soul is also made up of three different parts, isn't it, really? The, the scientists will call it the subconscious, the conscious and the unconscious. Um, but uh, other terms we'll use is um, mind, will and emotions, um, that aspect of us. So man is definitely made up of those um, three parts. In fact, I wonder, because throughout the Bible, the number six is often used to indicate man. And, um, and so hence the mark of the beast is a row of sixes, three sixes. Um, but Jesus, even when he turned the water to wine, did it in six pots for purification to symbolise man being purified. So there's lots of symbolism in the Bible and these patterns go throughout. So it helps us understand and read it. And I know some of you are getting it because I'm getting messages from people going, oh, I saw these three in the Bible. I see this. And, the, and so a lot of people are starting to actually read the Bible and see the pattern and what it's actually indicating, which is very exciting because it opens the Bible up on a very different level for you to uh, grow and understand but I think it's um, also three um, because we have the physical man that's symbolized in as I said the water the dirt and the gas and we have the the person the the live being type of creature <laughs> that we are made up of the body soul and spirit which I think are three and three makes six three different groups of three um, making six um, we also looked at how um, Jesus um, broke the temptation that Eve fell into with Adam and how their temptation 
was in the three areas, how the curses were in the three areas, um, how the results within them were in the three areas of spiritual, physical and emotional and then how Jesus came in the temptation area and bowed his life down to the will of God, not my will but yours as such, in the temptations, the three temptations that he faced from the enemy in those natural, spiritual and uh, emotional area as well and defeated it. So there was a lot in all these. But then it came to the next one, which has a heap of words, which is all about threes. And this is all about Jesus' time from the uh, Garden of Gethsemane um, all the way through to his death of three days being dead and all the threes that were involved in the time of the cross. And what that was saying to us is basically that Jesus was coming to deal with all emotional sin, all physical sin or, or results of death or I'll change the word, the language, emotional death, spiritual death and physical death, which of course physical death involves diseases and sickness. Emotional death is all the type places of hurt and depressions and, and you know loneliness and all those emotional things that we as humans can feel in the negative side of things. And, uh, and then spiritual death, of course, is our relationship with God first and foremost, but it also can affect um, other sin areas that we, we dabble in the occult or um, things like that, seances and things, that, that activates the wrong spirit world to our lives and uh, becomes portals to us as well. And so Jesus during the cross and all the different aspects of the three that were in the journey of the cross is because he was dealing with these three areas of chaos that have tried to rule us again and bringing um, death to them and defeating them and bringing them back under control. So basically the story in the Old Testament is starts with those three elements in chaos and how God brings them into order. And then we see how man, who's been left to rule, continuously gives in to the enemy who tries to continuously rob, kill and destroy and take the world and its occupants back into that element of chaos again. And that is the enemy's plan. But then there's the other side of the coin. You know, there's the night and there's the day day and night and they're two terms for the kingdoms of God light and darkness they're two kingdoms and so you have the other side which is God's kingdom and God's realm and it is made up also of three father son and the holy spirit and so we're going to look uh, a little bit at uh, that aspect in today's message first of all I want to start off with Jesus being our example. Jesus um, not only did those threes on the cross and then had three days where he was dead, he then rose triumphant over uh, that period of time. And um, he then had this example of being, um, when he was baptised, he became one with the Father. He was doing the Father's will. He was filled with the Spirit and bearing fruit and using the gifts of the Spirit. He was also born of a flesh uh, of a woman and, uh, but lived a sinless and righteous life. And so he's doing the example of the other side of the coin, of what it's like to live in life with God, in the day, in the light, rather than in the chaos, in, in the death and in the darkness. And so he has intentionally been an example for us. And interestingly enough, because it was mentioned by Shane, this verse, uh, and I've just taken part of it, the first John 4, 17, because as he is, so are we in this world. And the whole point of Jesus coming was to bring us back into the place that we were in in the Garden of Eden when we were living in life with God and that we had none of this chaos, none of this death in our lives where they were um, completely free from all emotional tor torment, all physical disease and sickness and in complete relationship with the Father and not with darkness and there was no ruling from darkness taking place in their lives and so Jesus 
aim is to bring us back into that. Scripture puts it in this way, that it was for this purpose that Jesus came, was to bring us freedom. It wasn't just to forgive our sins. That's one area. That's the emotional area where we carry shame and guilt and all those remorseful things that we feel where death of our emotions has taken place. He came to bring that forgiveness to us, but he also came to bring us that whole aspect of relationship with Father God again, back into relationship with him in that spiritual world. And he also came to bring us freedom from sin and from its control of our body and disease and sickness and all the physical torments that we can go through as well. And Jesus demonstrated it for us in so many ways. You know, like he walked on the water to show that he had power over the deep and the darkness. Whenever he was going somewhere where God had told him to go, Big storms would brew up. There's a couple of stories of that in the Bible. Big storms brewing up. And he would speak to the waters above and below and, and command them to be still. And they would be still. There was many times where Jesus took natural things like um, bread and the fish and divided it uh, and brought them back to life. Or healed somebody's physical eyes um, and healed physical Sicknesses like lameness and things like that, that he took authority over the physical realm because he showed he had authority over the emotional realm, over the physical realm, but also over the spiritual realm because he cast many demons out as well where people were tormented spiritually by things. And so he was displaying his authority over those three realms. He was saying that chaos is going to go back because I am a new Adam. I'm coming as the new Adam. The old Adam failed and all the generations that followed have failed. But a new Adam has come through Jesus for us to now transfer from the darkness to the day, to the light, and to become, in fact, I hear often some people say, oh God, let your light come. But scripture actually says, you, you, put your name in. Once were darkness, now you are our light. We actually change completely. That's why we're a new creation. That's why we use the language born again, because we're not of the kingdom of chaos. We're of the kingdom of the day and of life and life abundant. And so we need to learn to understand the fullness of what Jesus has done by seeing what the enemy has done in his chaos and destructions through to what Jesus has done in bringing us life and knowing that Jesus was an example of how we are meant to be because as he is, so are you, okay? And so we need to understand what did Jesus do that I can be like him? How did Jesus live and emanate a way that I am meant to live? What am I meant to do? Because he says things like, greater things that I've done, you'll do. And, and these signs will follow them. They'll cast out demons. They'll heal the sick. They'll raise the dead. There's those three elements again. And those three areas, come on, guys, we've got to start being active in these areas. Too often we're only active in one area in our relationship with God, but we actually got to bear fruit in all three areas. And too often we've received salvation, we've taken faith in what Jesus has done on the cross for us as both Christ and Lord, and we've only lived from the aspect of the cross and we've only lived from the aspect of forgiveness in our emotions. But there is so much more than we live. And you know it, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you look at the church of of acts you look at the testimony of people you can even look online and see people walking in incredible power of God and incredible freedom and miracles and then sometimes we look at ourselves and go hmm a bit of a deficit I don't believe it's a de deficit because you're not good enough I want to make that clear and God's made that clear this morning through the song service through the communion message it's not that we're not good enough all right but in saying that we're never good enough <laughs> Because we are human, if we stay in the kingdom of darkness, if we stay on that side of things, we're never good enough. But in this kingdom, we are good enough because we're in the image of God. We're filled with the power of God and we're equipped to live triumphantly and victoriously. In fact, he says he's made us more than conquerors, greater than him, in the sense of on this earth that we are now equipped with everything 
and he had to fight for us to get that, but now we've been given it and handed over to us and given that opportunity. You know, as Christians, we think about Judgment Day. And again, we were were told through Scripture this morning that there's no judgment when we come in love, a great, perfect love for us. But the issue is that love has a relationship and, and bears fruit of love. And so there will be a time where we have to give an account of what we've done. And it says that us who have received Jesus actually stand before Jesus, not before the Father. And we give an account to Jesus with what we've done with what he's given us. I think we lack, not because we're not good enough or because he's not good enough, but the lack of knowledge my people perish. And so the enemy goes about keeping things in the dark and deceiving us so that we don't understand the fullness of what he's done. Because if we do and our eyes become open, then we will live very different lives. And the devil is fearful of you becoming Jesus here on this earth. We know the impact that Jesus had while he lived and walked. How many people did he heal? All who came to him. How many people did he deliver? All who came to him. How many times did thousands of people turn to the Lord and follow him? And even the disciples after in Acts, we saw the same thing. Normal, average fishermen, tax gatherers who are backstabbing people that left their own nation and, and supported the, their enemies were transformed to be men in power, men walking free and bearing fruit from the kingdom of light. These are not superhumans. They've been supercharged with a revelation of what Jesus has done for them and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill it. And so, and in relationship one with the Father, Jesus' only prayer before he died, I don't know about you, but if I said to you, you're about to die in the next half an hour, I think they would start to think, okay, what have I got to do? Well, I, I'll ring my family and tell them I love them, you know, whatever. You'll all have some sort of reaction to what you want to do. Jesus' last few moments before he knew he was going to die was one of the things he prayed was, God, let them be one as we are one. Let them be found in us as part of us. Let them be one with one another and let them be one with, as I'm one with you, let them enter into that oneness. You know, he wanted all those things to take place in our lives. And so the point that we're making here is that as Jesus was, so can we be. And that's who we are called to be and nothing less than that. We stand and give an account to him about what we have produced with what he has done for us. And I think we need our eyes open again. I know I do. I need to continuously challenge my religious thinking or my justifications that have put a lid on myself or a lid on God and my knowledge and delve deeper. So... Matthew 28, 19 is a famous scripture we know. It's um, where Jesus says, Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, as we know, all the threes on the cross, dealt with everything, rose again. And before he goes, this is the commands, basically, he gives them. And he's saying, go and make disciples. The word disciple just simply means learner. We should all be carrying an L plate around our chest. Bright yellow L plates. We're learners. And that's where we stay for life. We never actually guarantee or or, um, graduate, I mean, until we uh, finish uh, our life. But we are learners. And so he's saying, go and make learners. People that are willing to learn. And that is a very important place for us to start because, as I said, we perish because of lack of knowledge and we don't get knowledge because we think we've attained and we go, oh, I've heard all these messages before, I've heard all these things. Look, I was brought up, my parents were pastors, 
um, and my grandparents were pastors. So I've been brought up in the house of God. I've heard probably every message under the sun and all the different angles there could possibly be around those verses. But I am discovering the Bible on a completely different layer. And that happened, one of the reasons was because I started to go in and study the meanings of words and start to follow things through. I've ignored all these talk that's out there on Facebook and, and other social media things that try to say, you know, the Bible, which Bible, all these versions are wrong. Just go to the concordance. The concordance gives you the meanings of words and, um, and you will understand what scripture is saying. You'll see the patterns that are there. Um, even I was encouraged by Ethan who uh, recently came back to the Lord and saw that the Bible had so many layers to it. There's this surface area of reading the Bible, but then there's these themes that run throughout the Bible, the Old Testament, all the stories of man failing and destroying and returning back to chaos. And then the New Testament, Jesus coming and defeating with the chaos and bringing us back to life and now man's journey back uh, into life and living in that realm and taking authority and rule again over the darkness and over the chaos. And then you have all the philosophical thinkings and patterns and, and treasures that are in there. The Bible is an immense, deep treasure. That's why I call my Bible study that I run uh, Treasure Hunters. Because the Bible says to learn to accurately divide the Word of God. Learn to accurately divide it. Dividing it means to analyse it and think about it. Don't just be a surface reader. That's just one area to learn in. And God will speak to you from that level, but there's so many different levels that you can go in the scripture that will reinforce and bring the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together for you in your mind. And, um, and so we have to uh, seek out the truth. God says things like, um, another verse that's one of my favourites, is it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of a king to search it out. Let's be kings and search it out. Let's be people that search out the truth and study and show ourselves approved of God. And that's important that we don't just become force-fed babies. You know, I've had people say to me over the years, this is too deep, too far not for me. How about you just study it and just give me what it is. Just feed me what's necessary. Well, that's fine. The Bible does talk about babies and that's fine. You'll probably be a baby um, and still enter into heaven. But he does say in Hebrews 5 that mature ones will have understood these things. And so we are going to have to give an account as to whether we've stood in maturity or in infancy uh, and remain there. And so I want to encourage you to embrace the Bible, to study the Bible. It is an amazing book um, that is mind-blowing and uh, leads us to God and to a revelation of who he's made you to be. If you know me from my past, um, as a child, I was a very insecure child um, and I was bullied right through the age of 11. I went to court for being um, bullied so severely it went to court, um, of which, of course, the case um, I, I was in favour of me. Um, and I had, like, even for the first year of school, um, my name, when I introduced myself, was, you know, you go up to, like, a four-year-old and you say, hello, darling, or five-year-old, what's your name? Uh, actually, it probably was six because it was right through to grade one. I would tell you my name was Stupid Idiot. That's how I introduced myself. And I would vomit every day on the way to school from the trauma of having to go to school and stuttered and stammered and I was a very insecure person. And so as a teenager, I became very defensive and very aggressive to protect myself. I was known for fighting, physical fights in my high school and I was known for defending myself um, because I was embattered, if you like, and rejected and hated who I was. And it wasn't until God did a work on me that I realised that I was absolutely, he broke me so much that made me realise that I was nothing without him. 
And that is where the starting point comes, that we come then in that place of brokenness, that we realise that we can't be our own saviours, we can't live lives ourselves, that chaos will always beat us and destroy us. And we might work on our physical bodies and get some area of health in us and then have a car accident and the enemy robs it from us, just like that. You know, we can work emotionally and be strong-minded. I'm a very strong-minded person. I'm, I used to run races. If you know anything about running marathons, you've got to be a strong-minded person to be able to do that. I was a strong-minded person. I was proud of my strong mind. But you have to lose your mind. And I literally did have a mental breakdown and things like that to realise that my mind, I can be as strong as I like. But when I had a car accident and you have panic attacks from your subconscious and you've got no control of them, you realise how frail your mind is. I can do things and try and work my own salvation by studying the Bible and knowing the Word of God. And I use that as a weapon. So much so that in the youth group in Toowoomba, they used to call me the dragon lady. You better watch out for her. Because she'll come along with the scripture and tell you what you're doing wrong. And I used the scripture continuously like that. And I was proud of it until God made me realize I was no better than Saul. I was murdering his people. And, um, and I needed to repent and, um, and come into relationship with him. That's very brief. But the thing is that I'm bringing that up because I tried to be myself strong, independent in all those three areas. But then God showed me that I was a failure in all those things. I could not defeat the enemy in those areas. Chaos would consume me. Death would invade in my life continuously over and over again. But when I realised what Jesus had done for me, when I realised the power of what he's done for me and that by faith, nothing I do but except receive it because it's an act of love, a gift. What does the receiver of a gift do to receive the gift? It's nothing other than accept it. The gift is given by the quality of the person. The quality of gift is given by the character of the, th- of the person giving it. And God has given great love to the world, to us individually and to the rest of them out there as well, to everyone. And he gives that gift because he's a generous giver, a loving giver, and he wants to bring us life. And he used Jesus, the greatest gift that he could give, to produce that for our lives. And so Jesus, once he died and resurrected again, he wanted to give instructions. And those instructions were for us to go and make disciples, but... And from all nations, from all people groups, everywhere. But we were to baptise them. Baptising means to be fully immersed in. Now get the picture. That means we can't stand, I'll stay shadow line, we can't stand in darkness and in light. We can't sit on the fence. We must be fully immersed to be free. We must be fully embracing the truth of what he has given us, spirit, soul and body, and in that life and in that realm. We can't live half in the day and half in the night. We must live fully in the light for us to be able to um, live from that place. So baptising is the word to be fully whelmed, to be fully consumed with something. And in the name of, the name of is to do with the specific characteristics and authority of the person. Father God is very different to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit. They have very different functions. They have very different roles. They do very different things. There is a lot of crossover. There's a lot of things like the word light. God is light. Uh, Jesus came to bring the kingdom of light. And he said, while he's here, the light is here. Um, and then he creates us to be lights um, in his place. And then you have the Holy Spirit who, what was the first thing that appeared when they got baptised in the Holy Spirit? Tongues of fire. Well, that word fire is also the same word light. Um, And so they're empowered by the spirit of light as such as well. And so um, the name of when we baptise somebody, when somebody is fully immersed, they're fully immersed into the characteristics. And I've separated them out because they're three individuals. All right? They're not, they are one, but they are three individuals. I'm holding fingers, four fingers up, can't count. Three individuals. Um, three individuals that are individual 
in their personalities, in the, their function, in their authority levels, um, etc. So here's one quick question for you. Can the Holy Spirit forgive you? No. His offense isn't to the Holy Spirit. Can Jesus forgive you? Here's a quick one. No, he cannot forgive you. The offense wasn't to Jesus because God sent Jesus to deal with the offense. It's the Father that we say sorry to. It's specifically the Father. So was the Father our saviour? No, he wasn't. Was the Holy Spirit our saviour? No, he wasn't. Jesus was our saviour. Right? The Holy Spirit is the one that does the creating and seals us and protects us and, and preserves us for the day when Jesus returns. Is God do that? Is that his role? No, to come and convict us and walk with us and dwell in us? No. Is it, is it Jesus' role? No, he's not in your heart. I've had children teaching in Sunday school think that Jesus is sitting in their heart like a little tiny picture of Jesus in their heart. That's the image they get when our language. No, we're actually, there's more verses about, yes, there is verses about being him in us, but there's more verses of actually us being in him. Um, but where he is now is seated in heavenly places. So he's not here walking the earth. He's like the spirit. He says it's better I go so the spirit could come. And so he's there. And it's the spirit now that's walking with us. And so they have all got specific individual things that we need to enter into. And many people, when they first become Christians, hear the message. And that's another thing in itself. The gospel message is not the message of Jesus died on the cross so you can have your sins forgiven to go to heaven. That is not the message. It's the gospel of the kingdom and Jesus himself went about preaching the kingdom and displaying the kingdom and saying, tell everyone the kingdom of God is near and available. It's about transferring from this realm to this realm, to one kingdom, to another kingdom. And living in there, the sin is what was stopping us being able to transfer. And so Jesus came to give us that freedom and the dealing with the sin so that we could transfer. And so... Um, we have to understand that most people have only done a baptism of repentance where they say sorry to God, Father God, for what they've done and they say, I believe in what Jesus has done. And so that does bear fruit. Um, the man on the cross, that's exactly what ha happened to him. The thief on the cross, he repented, didn't he? The one that was beside Jesus, he realised that he was a sinner and he repented and Jesus said to him, today you're going to be with me in paradise. All right, so repentance and receiving that often done in the form of a sinner's prayer, which is not scriptural, but it's just our way of, uh, of having evidence of somebody's heart changing. Um, that is a literal and uh, valid way of us entering into the kingdom of God. However, the man on the cross, the thief on the cross that did that, did he have to bear fruit afterwards? Was he living afterwards to do anything? No, he died and went straight up to heaven. So if you want to have an altar call of salvation where we then go bang, 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 bang and you all go home, that's fine. But that's not what's meant to happen. You're meant to actually then carry the kingdom of God. You're now meant to walk as Jesus walked, which means we have to bear fruit and we can't do it without understanding fully what Jesus has done and entering into what Jesus has done and becoming new creations and washing away the sins uh, from our lives. Uh, and nor can we do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't know, don't know about you, but the Holy Spirit is the one that brings the um, emotions of love and peace and kindness and gentleness, etc. I know my emotions, even though I'm trying to be as godly as I can, rise up and show this side, <laughs> the old man rather than the new man, continuously. So I need more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I need more relationship with the Holy Spirit. I know that I can't produce... Um, healing I can't produce like it says these signs will follow those who believe so evidence that we've believed is that we can cast out demons well I definitely can't do that without the Holy Spirit healed the sick definitely can't do that you know I might be able to give you a band-aid <laughs> or a bit of Panadol but I definitely can't heal you um, and I definitely can't raise the dead I have tried that um, I tried raising a dog <laughs> 
Um, Darren had buried it and a day later I was like, I should have tried. <laughs> I made him dig it up and then I tried. But the reason I was doing it was because I'm going, I want to live from this realm. I have to deal with my mind the knowledge that I have that actually tells me this is the realm I deserve, this is the realm that control, controls me, this is the realm that contains me, this is the realm that puts the lid on me and controls everything I do, and this is the realm that has power over me. No, no, i have transferred from the master there, and now Jesus is my Lord, my master, and I need to learn to live from that. And so I will do silly things like that because... I want to live in that realm. And the reason I'm not living in that realm is because my mind keeps on trying to tell me I'm back here. Yeah? That I deserve to be back here. And also, I'm there sometimes because I don't know the scripture enough and I don't know what God has done enough for me and I need to meditate on it and change my thinking so I can actually start to live from this realm. And so... Also, baptism is not about us saying when we water baptise somebody, oh, in the name of the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now you're baptised. That's fine if we do that, but it's not what it's referring to. It's saying enter into their names, enter into their authority. That word name, when you look it up in the Greek, means the authority and character of that person. We can have people of the same name in this room and I could call them and they would have completely different personalities, completely different skill sets, completely different integrity levels, you know. And so when we're calling on the name of somebody, we get the person, the character, their skills, who they are, don't we? Yeah. So you can have multiple Janines, but each one of us will be very different and so we have to understand that we're activating the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit and, and those aspects. So um, we want to enter into um, water baptism through um, that area. Um, so just a, a little side point. Father God... Um, I believe he has the three aspects within him as well. So God is light. He's the opposite of darkness, which is that whole um, chaos element of darkness. He's the opposite to that. Um, and so that means the very first thing that God brought to the earth when he said in creation, let there be light was the first thing he spoke. That Day four was when the sun came, so it's not that light. Let there be light was himself. Let me be here in this starting point. And so he is, that's why he's the father, because everything created came from him. And uh, in the New Testament, there's a nice verse that's very confusing. It says something like, when the light is on, all that remains is light. That's paraphrasing it in Janine version to try and simplify it. But when the light is on, all that remains is light. And it's basically saying everything, everything we see is from him. We might have crafted it, but all the substances it's formed from is light. It's all come from him. And, uh, and so he is that first point of um, physical um, manifestation of us for everything physical as well. So he's not only um, spiritually light represented, but he's also physically uh, we're made in his image. His breath is in our lungs uh, everything that's formed physically is from him as well. And, of course, he is love is another verse. God is love. And so he is the place that all our emotions should flow from um, because love has healthy emotions and a healthy soul is a loved soul. And, and so he is those aspects as well. The Holy Spirit, um, also when we get baptised into him, um, he is... Um, he quickens our mortal bodies, our physical bodies. He produces emotional health through all the um, fruits of the spirit. And he also gives us spiritual gifts that empower us um, spiritually. So he aspect, the Holy Spirit affects the three parts of our being as well. So Father God affects the three parts. The Holy Spirit affects the three parts. And of course, Jesus did the same thing um, and there's so much you could say about what Jesus did because we know in Scripture very much about him. But um, basically he became our physical example, um, a living free spirit. 
and soul and body and how to be that. Uh, he demonstrated power over the enemy of darkness and demons, sickness, as well as forgiving people. Uh, and he lived a spirit-led relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit and with man. And so he um, demonstrated all of those things. Um, so coming back to us, how we're made uh, in the three parts as well, the dirt, the gas and the water, emotional, um, spiritual and uh, physical, we have no choice when we're made we're all made in the same physical form. You know, we don't have extra heads and limbs and arms and 20 noses and whatever. We're all in that same cookie cutter um, physical. We have no say over that. We're still going to be made up of dirt, water and gas, no matter what we do. Uh, emotionally, we have no choice over that as well. We um, are all going to have the subconscious, the conscious, the unconscious mind or the my, um, will mind, will and emotions, um, we're all made in that cookie cut. But we do get to choose what spirit world we're going to live from, whether we're going to live from this realm or we're going to live from this realm. And so we get the choice of whether we're going to um, offer up our lives uh, as a sacrifice uh, and reflect the kingdom of God and the kingdom of light here on this earth. So these, I just want us to quickly see the name of the Father. Um, this is if we get baptised into the name of the Father. Now, they'll, it, it's not an exhaustive. It's, um, there'll be more and more facets that they could probably say about the Father. But these are some of the things in Scripture that we know about him. The word Abba um, there in the second column in the middle is actually the word Daddy. Not the word Father, but it's more like Daddy, more that intimate um, thing. But he is all these um, things. And um, they're his personality, they're his name, they're his character, they're the realms that he's in charge of. And um, we have judge and magistrate there um, because he is the ultimate judge and magistrate. However, he's going to be doing um, the judging uh, on a greater scale. He does more of the demonic realm and uh, through scripture it tells us that. And Jesus does the people. Um, but he's the final judge of it he's the creator Yahweh it's um, life itself yeah <laughs> Yahweh um, as we heard in another message from Darren here's the son aspects of the son um, of Jesus um, the way the truth and the life the lion the vine the light there's so many aspects of what he is and they're different to what God the father has done for us and so when we get baptized we get baptized into that so you know with with the father how we get baptized is repentance it's done in the heart it's instantaneous it's when somebody first hears the gospel of the kingdom and realizes they're living in this realm and then they go oh god loved me so much that he actually made a way for me to transfer to this world out of this world i don't enjoy this world there's full of death i can see all the chaos i can see all my failings i can see but I'm under control. Let's believe in what Jesus has done on the cross for me, for what Father God did by sending Jesus. And now I'm going to be turned my life around and living for God. I'm going to seek his ways. That's called repentance, to turn around or to think differently. And so I'm not going to think from this realm anymore. I've got to change my thinking, or the Bible says to renew my mind daily so that I don't think from this natural world, but instead I learn to live and think from this world. And I cast down imaginations and anything lofty that exalts itself against the word of God. And instead now I think on good things and I think on the truth of what God says. So that's repentance or baptism for the Father. In the Bible, um, Jesus did that in the form of John the Baptist baptizing. We know that it changed because uh, later on when um, Peter or Paul was traveling around, he came across a group. He was going from city to city and he came across a group of uh, men who said that they were disciples. And he said, ah, the disciples, fantastic. What were you baptized into? And they were like, we were baptised. In, oh, no, he said, first of all, he said to them, uh, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they were like, Holy Spirit? What's the Holy Spirit? 
And he said, well, what baptism have you had then? So note the language. He expects if somebody's going to call themselves a disciple, they would have had the other baptisms because they're alive. They're not gone to heaven like the thief on the cross. They've got to produce stuff and we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. So he's gone, well, what baptism have you had then? And they said to him, oh, we had the baptism of John. And he said, oh, that's the baptism of repentance. Now you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and water. And scripture then tells us that they went and got baptized in the water. And as they came up, they laid hands on them and they filled with the Holy Spirit. So they had the other two baptisms. So it's not good enough in scripture's story and telling for us just to make a decision to become a Christian and decide and say a prayer and repent to the Father. As I said, unless we're going to go straight home. If we're to bear fruit and live here victorious lives and represent Jesus, we have to have the other two baptisms as well. They're not if I choose to. Um, and in fact, Scripture, if you read Acts, uh, I challenge you to read Acts if you don't believe me and see how many times people had all the baptisms straight away. Um, and like the jailers, things like that. There's a story of the jail and the prison doors open and immediately the whole household believes and are water baptised and then filled in the Holy Spirit. Or the house of Cornelius hearing the gospel and suddenly start to speak in tongues as evidence that their heart had changed. And so then he said, well, what's denying them water? And then they all got water baptised. So you'll see it over and over again. Uh, how we do the baptism of the sun is through the water baptism. Why water? Because it's representing the deep. Remember the deep that was in chaos? The abyss of surging water that leads to hell. And so Jesus, when he died, went to hell and he defeated and took the keys of death and hell. So when we, scripture tells us, when we get water baptized, it's as if we're assimilating at the same time as if we are entering into Jesus' body, entering into the tomb, the water completely whelms us, that's baptised, to be completely whelmed, and then we rise up again like Jesus, assimilating into life. So it's the transference, not just the forgiveness, but the transference time, transferring us from this realm to this realm. It's entering into his kingdom. It's where scriptures say, now I'm hidden in Christ because I've entered into what he's done and I've risen again. Everything that Jesus is is now applied to me. And so I'm hidden in him. Um, and so that's very simplistic, but that's basically what happens with the water baptism uh, into the sun. And the last one that we need is the Holy Spirit. Um, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit was traditionally done by laying on a hands. It's an impartation um, thing. It's basically saying you have the Holy Spirit dwell within you and then you impart that dwelling into somebody else. Um, House of Cornelius, though, and of course the day of Pentecost, they didn't have that. The day of Pentecost was the first time the Holy Spirit fell and lived and remained and dwelt um, with man. And then... Um, House of Cornelius, it was done that way with the group of Gentiles because the Jews arrogantly remained thinking no Gentile can become Christian, godly or anything. And so they, God did a miracle by giving a vision um, of unclean animals and telling Peter to eat of it. And he's like, no, no. And it happened three times until three men came to the door and told him to go with them. And then he went to uh, their house and the man there said, an angel told me, come, told me where to send my three men to get you. And, um, and so he then uh, entered into telling them the gospel and the Spirit of God fell on them, which then he was like, okay, they're all Gentiles. I didn't think they could do this. I thought this was very unique for us. Um, we're God's people. We're the ones that are special. And now he realised that they were also being grafted in to join them and so um, that was the only other time but most times it's done by the laying on of hands um, in scripture. A lot of people will tell me I received the Holy Spirit when I gave my heart to the Lord. That's great. Then I want to see the evidence of that. Can you prophesy? Do you speak in tongues? Do you have words of knowledge? Are you starting to bear fruit from those realms? Um, because it's not something that automatically happens the Spirit of God was in the Old Testament. He would come and fall on somebody and then go again. But with Jesus, 
he said the spirit would come and dwell and remain. And so that's a very different thing. It's different for, for example, you to come visit me at my house is very different for you turning up and moving into my house to live with me, yeah? And we have a very different level of relationship. When somebody lives with you, it's very different than, hey, let's have a coffee every now and then. All right? And so that's great. Nobody can come to the Father. Nobody can actually get saved unless the Spirit draws them. So the Spirit of God is actually working on all the lost right now. But he doesn't dwell in them. He's not infilled them. They've not become his temple. All right? His dwelling place. That happens with the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we enter into the name of the Holy Spirit. And all the things that he does for us are incredible. He's the one that will correct us. He's the one that will give us wisdom. I certainly need lots of wisdom. He's the one that teaches. He's the one that reveals. He's the one that intercedes. I just love that aspect. There are so many times in my personal life where I've not known how to pray about a situation and I've spoken in tongues and the Holy Spirit intercedes about that situation in ways that I couldn't even imagine and I see things turn around in ways that are just mind-blowing and that comes from him. Um, I haven't even listed all the things that he can do um, as in the healings and the casting out the spirits and uh, um, miracles and things like that that happen when we walk with the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is another essential to our lives because we're going to have to give an account for bearing fruit. And I know when I look at my life, I go, okay, I've, I've done well for myself, but I don't see a lot of these signs following and I want to see an increase of those signs following. And so I need to in increase my knowledge of what God's done for me, put faith in it, accept it, activate it, live from it, and um, start to walk in those areas so I can see fruit from these areas in my life. And so today I want to encourage you. You know your personal walk with God. It is a very individual God. He knows each one of us personally, just like you know each of your children and their little idiosyncrasies, um, yet you still have your family standard. You don't bow your family standard as the parent. You just work with each child with where they're at to try and get them to clean their bedrooms or clean their teeth or whatever. And I know because I've had one child who was like, a straight A student with another child with a learning difficulty. So I've had two quite extremes uh, out of my three children and each one's personality was very different and each process was very different and individual to get them to do the most simple tasks. And so God looks the same at us. He loves each one of us. He's not condemning any of you, but he will encourage you and say, this is my standard. I gave Jesus to die on the cross to deal with those three elements and I want you to enter into life in all those elements. And it's done through relationship with the Father, with the Son and with the Holy Spirit to bring that complete fullness of life to us.